It's Tuesday, June 9th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And this next video is an unedited interview I did with Sarah Zaman, a Pakistani American who works for the Voice of America, Urdu, in Washington, D.C. A video that I'd posted before, but it was all translated to Urdu language, the local language there in Pakistan, or one of them. And so this video will be just the plain English version. So we'll start out with a little bit of banter before we start the official interview as we kind of set, uh, talk about what kind of questions, what kind of content we want to talk about. And then we go on with the interview. And Sarah asks a lot of good questions because she reached out to me after watching my video series here on Blanco Lirio on the tragic loss of Pakistan's Flight 8303 in Karachi. So thanks again for your support of this channel and thanks again for the overwhelming amount of support I'm getting on the new $1 per month tier over on Patreon as we work through this whole demonetization problem with YouTube together. Thanks so much for your support. See you here. Okay, so like I uh, briefly discussed with you, you know, where I, I don't want to put the blame on anyone just because an investigation is ongoing. So this is more for people's purposes of basic understanding. You know, mm -hmm. what happens in an investigation? What will the investigators be looking at? Um, what is the standard procedure for landing a plane? Is belly landing an option? What happens in that case? So basic questions that people are asking, even under your videos. You know, a lot of people, I was noticing a lot of people were saying, why did he take off? Why didn't he just stay on the ground? Mm -hmm. So there must be some procedure of a proper belly landing as well. Mm -hmm. What is that procedure? And could that have been activated? Those kind of things. So <clears throat> I'll record your introduction afterwards. So I'm just going to start with the interview and... I am going to... All right, Juan, thank you so much for your time. You are an experienced pilot. You have almost 40 years of experience flying planes. When you look at what happened, what stands out the most to you? Uh, well, the instability of the approach, that is the high, fast, and steep approach into the airport, the fact that it appears as though the pilots were surprised that the gear was not down and so that when they touched down on the runway, they touched down on the engines and were startled by this and then initiated the go around too late. Uh, and then that just snowballed into a whole disastrous series of events. But it mm -hmm. begins, I believe this story begins with the unstable approach into Karachi Airport. Mm -hmm. too now, high too fast so a lot of people and lay people like myself when we look at something like this where you see scratch marks on the runway mm -hmm. people are asking why not just stick to a belly landing why take off yes what is the procedure of a belly landing was that even an option in a situation like this a belly landing is your absolutely last resort if you have some kind of major malfunction with your landing gear there are numerous ways to get these get the landing gear down on these aircraft. If you have any indication of a landing gear malfunction at all, anywhere on your approach, you simply need to break off that approach and go into a holding pattern and sort it out. This flight had plenty of fuel, as all flights do, have plenty of fuel reserves to handle such a malfunction. So the fact that they hit the runway and then went around indicates to me that they were startled. They were surprised that this gear was not down uh, when they touchdown on the runway so because of that startle the natural instinct would be to oh no i forgot the gear i'm going around in hindsight yeah would it have been better had they to for them to stay on the ground perhaps but they are already keyed up that they know they're coming in too fast and landing too far down the runway they are already keyed up to go around something they should have done a long time earlier mm -hmm. And the Karachi runway is about 11,000 feet long. And the scratch marks, the photos of which we're seeing, and I must point out here that PIA has not yet made any comment about the authenticity of pictures or any audios that are circulating on the internet. But there are websites that show you exact trajectory of the flight, and those uh, websites record data from all over the world. They are considered authentic sources. When we look at those pictures, and you see that on an 11,000 feet long runway, you see scratch marks around 4,500 feet. One, what does that tell you? 
That tells me that they landed too far down the runway. The, the normal standard operating procedure is to land in the first one third of the runway. And in the case of a long runway, no further than 3000 feet down the runway. So this indicates to me that they touched down much too far down the runway. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you this question just one more time. Your answer was perfectly fine, but I want to just change my question just a little bit. Okay. Um, so, so on any runway, we know that the Karachi runway is about 11,000 feet long. On any runway, when an airplane uh, is landing, and especially uh, an A320, the plane that experienced this accident, when a plane is landing, what are some of the calculations in a pilot's mind in terms of when to touch down? Karachi runway is about 11,000 feet long. What should be the ideal touchdown distance? Standard operating procedure for all airliners is to land in the first third of the runway. If you do not land in the first third of the runway or at the very least within the first 3,000 feet of a long runway, you must go around. So the first third of the runway is the goal. And the goal is to come over the threshold on approach speed at 50 feet in order to touch down on that first third. And this is all ensured by having a stabilized approach in the first place coming into the runway. You're a flight officer right now, the first officer on mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Boeing 777. Mm -hmm. The recordings that are circulating on the internet, one question people are raising is, we don't really hear the first officer say much. What's the role of the first officer? Well, we don't know who's talking on the radio. Usually you have a pilot flying and a pilot not flying. Usually the pilot not flying is the person talking on the radio. And it's unclear at the, this time who was flying the aircraft, who was not flying the aircraft, and who was talking on the radio. But the main thing, the, the, the concern we have with the first officer at this point is, was he open to communicate with the captain uh, without uh, interference, without obscuration, without was he clearly able to communicate with the captain and tell him when the param when he was flying out of parameters that he was doing so and they needed to go around? Why didn't somebody say go around? Why the it was clear that the parameters were not met for a for a stabilized approach. Uh, somebody at some point should have said go around. Now we don't have the cockpit voice recorder so we don't know how that conversation went maybe he did say so and maybe th the captain overruled him we don't know the end of that story yet so right we, we don't to... have all the pieces to this puzzle right so the investigation team from airbus is in pakistan what are some of the key elements you would say they would be looking at they got to get the data recorders as soon as the, the data recorders will tell the whole story uh, get those data recorders get them downloaded and then put all that data together They'll also be looking carefully at the engines to find out exactly what caused the engines to fail. Mm -hmm. And right. OK, uh, one other piece of information we have is uh, one other piece of information we have is Airbus told us that this plane had about 47,000 hours of flying time on it. And we know that the pilot also had about 17,000 hours. What do these numbers tell us? That, that was a very, very experienced pilot. The captain was a very experienced pilot. And the aircraft hours, that's about normal for a uh, Airbus-type aircraft that's put into service. Mm -hmm. um, we, when, you know, you're an experienced pilot. When a situation like this is happening where you see that you're just seconds away from making a comfortable landing and then suddenly things start to fall out of place. What goes on in the minds of those who are sitting in the cockpit? Well, hopefully they were, they, you always need to be ahead of the jet. You can, an experienced pilot can see this situation developing miles out there, well beyond 10,000 feet. This aircraft was at 10,000 feet, four minutes from the touchdown. You could have seen this developing that he should have been at 10,000 feet, more like 30 30 miles out, a much further distance. And then you can see the, the, the lack of speed control or the excessive speed control. You can see this whole situation developing. So from an experienced pilot, it's time to speak up. It's time to take action, to do something, to abandon this approach. Hot and high approaches do happen to experienced pilots. 
we just need to accept that the we're out of the parameters and we need to go around and try it again. Somebody needs to speak up and say that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of any technical assistance that airplane manufacturers provide to airlines, what is generally the standard? Oh, it's a high degree of standard. It's all very highly regulated. Uh, the, the maintenance schedule, the training, the manufacture of the aircraft, it's all very highly regulated. And as long as you stick to the standard operating procedures consistently, you should be able to prevent these sort of accidents. It's when you deviate from the standard operating procedure that you begin to have these sort of problems. And in terms of routine maintenance that happens on a plane, can you tell us a little bit about that? How frequently is it done in general? Uh, they, they are on a continuously rotating maintenance schedule, and so those schedules are regulated by the industry in agreement with the manufacturer, and it can be a, a time-based or a number of hours of service-based. One thing investigators will need to be look at, looking at in this situation is, was this aircraft stored because of the COVID-19 situation? Did it come out of a short-term storage? Uh, even when the aircraft are in a short-term storage, they're still being inspected and looked at on a several over several days or uh, maybe once or twice a week if it's in a long term term storage situation that it may sit there for a month or so but the aircraft are still checked and made ready for operation even in a short term storage event prior to the flight the aircraft is pre-flighted by both the crew and ground crew members as well and if there was any anomaly with the with any of the systems it would probably come up on that pre-flight inspection as you power up the aircraft and you would have to take the time to get that resolved before you took off. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, in your years of flying, you have seen accidents happen all over the world between machine malfunction and human error. What's more common? It's It usually comes down to a, a human error and or a misapplication of emergency procedures in the event of a mechanical malfunction. And again, very rarely is it one single thing that brings down an aircraft. It's after the investigation is all done, and this is why they take a year, year and a half to do. They got to investigate every aspect of it. There's usually a long series of events that occur in a row that causes the accident to happen in the first place. All right. Um, do you think we covered everything or do you think we need to look at a, any anything else as well for an average person to understand? Um, you might ask about oh, uh, the the engines quitting or after what happened after he hit the runway. Sure, sure. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to hang up this call just to look at the video that we've recorded so far just to make sure the, okay. the video quality was all right. And then I'll resume. I'll call you okay. back in Sounds just good. a moment. All right. So looking at the pictures of the crash, what are some conclusions that can be drawn by an expert like you? If you look at the picture taken by the Pakistan uh, uh, spotter, spotters, they got a picture of the aircraft after it made contact with the runway and before it crashed. That picture shows that the bottoms of the engines are damaged and there's very little damage to the tail of the aircraft, which indicates to me that he hit the runway at a very high rate of speed and was able to get the aircraft back up into the air. When those engines hit the runway, investigators are going to be looking very closely at that damage, and what they're going to be looking at is what's mounted on the bottom of those engines, and that's the accessory drive gearboxes. And on those accessory drive gearboxes are critical accessories like fuel pumps, oil pumps, hydraulic pumps, and generators. Also in that photograph, you'll notice something called a rat, a ram air turbine sticking out of the bottom of the fuselage. That indicates to me that that rat deploys automatically when it senses a loss of left and right AC power. The, in other words, either both engines are quitting or both engine-driven generators have failed, thus automatically deploying the rat. The extensive amount of damage to those accessory drive gearboxes is what investigators are going to be looking at, which ultimately led to the dual engine failure of the aircraft and its ultimate, ultimately crashing into the apartment building. So the ram 
air turbine is able to give them emergency electrical power and emergency hydraulic power to continue to operate the flight controls. Mm -hmm. However, the, the engines spool down and the aircraft slowly loses airspeed and basically stalls, stalls aerodynamically stalls. The wings quit flying as, as the aircraft crashes into the buildings. Mm -hmm. If we look at the last 40, 50 years of civil aviation, in terms of being unusual, how would you rank this accident? This is very unusual uh, for an airline type operation. This is the first time I've heard of uh, somebody hitting the engines on the ground without the gear extended in an airliner type aircraft and, and getting it back up off of the ground. This, however, is relatively common in general aviation or small aircraft flying. Again, because of that startle factor, s small aircraft pilots will sometimes forget to put their landing gear down and they will be startled when they realize that they're touching down without the gear and they'll go around even after they've hit the propeller of the aircraft, uh, done some significant damage. This is the first time I've ever heard this done in an airline uh, operation. In terms of aviation, what are some differences in the experiences of a military pilot and a civil aviation pilot? And the reason why I'm asking this is that the team of experts that's been set up in Pakistan to investigate this, uh, it's receiving this criticism that there is no civil aviation pilot mm. on that team. All of the officials are uh, Air Force officials. What's the difference in their level, in, their, in the type of experience? The investigators investigating this need to be intimately familiar with the standard operating procedures of airline aircraft and particularly the standard operating procedures for Pakistan International Airlines. They need to know what the normal standard operating procedures are so they can see and recognize deviations from those standard procedures. Military flying is different. It's just uh, a bit different than those standard uh, many things apply but you need to know the intimate details of the standard daily operating procedures for that airline Juan you have flown the A320 aircraft what are some of the circumstances in which the landing gear would not come out what could be some reasons for that mm, there could be any number of reasons why the gear may not come down but if there was a problem with the landing gear not coming down, the crew would recognize this or you would be alerted to it very early on and the crew would simply take the aircraft around, go into a holding pattern and sort it out. It could be a hydraulic problem, could be an electric problem, could be a problem with the computers, um, any number of problems. But there's also any number of ways to get the landing gear down, it's particularly uh, a manual extension is an option on the Airbus A320. There's a crank in between the two pilots on the rear pedestal with three clockwise rotations on this crank. The gear will fall down via gravity. So there's any number of ways to get the gear down in the event of a, any kind of a malfunction. But you got to go take the time to go through the procedures and do that. The routine... I'm sorry, go ahead. Now, there's one other thing. Maybe we touched on this earlier. Uh, there's a design limitation on the Airbus where the maximum placarded indicated airspeed that you can lower the landing gear on an Airbus is 250 knots indicated airspeed. And that's to avoid structural damage to the landing gear and the doors. And in order to um, enhance the safety features of that, Airbus has provided a safety valve that prevents you from lowering the landing gear if your airspeed is above 260 knots. So mm -hmm. if the computer sense that speed, it will uh, prevent you from, even if you put the landing gear handle down, the safety valve will not open up and you will not get hydraulic pressure to lower the landing gear if your indicated airspeed is above 260 knots to avoid structural damage to the landing gear. All right. And in terms of maintenance also, let's say uh, during the pre-flight check on any flight, mm -hmm. is it possible to detect a problem with landing gear at that stage? You you visually inspect the landing gear on each pre-flight inspection. It's easy to inspect because uh, when you do your walk around, you it's very accessible to look at that, notice any hydraulic leaks or any problems with that. And then if there's any problem with the landing gear computer system of which there are two they work one at a time and they swap on each uh, on each uh, flight sequence that would be alerted through the ecam system and that would be that 
you would probably be notified of that on pre-flight inspection when you power up the aircraft or when you get ready to go if there was a problem with one of the landing gear computers. All right. So basically, when you're flying, in case your speed is too high, the plane would prevent the landing gear from coming out on its own. That's correct. If you tried to lower the landing gear and your speed was too high above 260 knots, the safety system will not allow the gear to come down. Now, what we don't understand, what I don't understand yet, is if if you, if you do that and then you subsequently reduce your airspeed, will the gear then come down or do you have to recycle the landing gear handle? I'm not sure what the procedure is on that. None of us <laughs> mm -hmm. tested that system to that extent. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I just wanted to, you know, touch on the technical sure. aspect also of the landing gear because that's that's where this whole conversation kind of started from. Mm -hmm.